And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Lloyd, who's a medical director of his, of his hospital, a VA hospital, who's come out from Tennessee, and he's going to share his own experience with prescription narcotic abuse and the effects on uh, the population. And let me, before you start, uh, maybe I'll put uh, Dr. Lloyd on the spot a little bit. Dr. Lloyd, by the way, is the White House uh, Office of uh, Drug Policy Control uh, advocate champion of 2014. So he's working with the White House. And he, I, the one question that I have, and we've spent a couple of days together, I'd love you know, for you to hear more about his story, but also is why do you think the medical profession in California, the medical establishment in California is opposed to Prop 46? And do you think the medical profession is actually going to benefit from this uh, as opposed to the medical lobby? Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, in asking me the question about why the medical profession would be opposed to Prop 46, I think the, the first thing would be uh, probably the, the, the raising of the, of the malpractice cap, and that's not uh, within my purview of, of, of expertise, so I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Uh, the, the second reason would be for the mandatory drug testing of, of physicians. And I think for that one, it's because we view addiction as a as a moral disease. Uh, addiction is not a moral disease. Addiction is a addiction is an organic disease of the brain. It's like high blood pressure. It's like diabetes. And I would I would uh, I would ask that you think about it in those terms. And and it is a silent disease. I can tell you that every morning during my active disease, and and I was at the I was at nearing the bottom at the time that Bob was losing his family. Uh, 10 years ago and every morning I woke up and I would get up out of my bed and I walk into my bathroom and I would look at uh, pictures of my children on my on my sink when I was getting uh, getting ready for work every morning and I would cry uh, knowing that I couldn't stop and I would throw a handful of pills in my mouth and go off to work for another day and I thought that I would die in my sleep I thought that's how my life would end in the shame of telling someone that I had addictive disease I couldn't do it and that's the way my life was day after day and I had a disease and I looked at it as a moral failure. And so long as we look at it as a moral failure, that's what we'll be destined for. So I think that doctors look at it as a, as a moral failure. It is not. And I think that drug testing will allow us to uncover, uh, uncover it as a disease that it is and will allow us to uh, bring doctors out of the shadow who are suffering from addiction, allow, allow us to treat them, and put them back into the profession where they are not uh, endangering the lives of others. Uh, this is a patient safety position, like an airline pilot, uh, like a bus driver. And, uh, you know, I, I teach my students all the time, you know, when I'm, when I'm on the airplane coming out to the Bay Area. Uh, it says, if we lose cabin pressure, put the oxygen on yourself before you put it on the, on the per person next to you. That's because if you can't breathe, you can't do the person next to you any good. I teach my students that in the doctor-patient relationship in the room, um, you know, who's the most important person in that relationship? And the students and residents always go, well, it's the patient. No, it's not. It's the doctor because the patient doesn't stand a chance if I'm not healthy. And I would say that the medical profession needs to approach it that way. That in order for me to do the patient any good, I have to be healthy myself. And for us to do any good as a profession, we have to identify those of us that have addictive disease. And the easiest way to do that is with mandatory drug screening. So don't look at it as an opportunity or, a, or don't look at it as a punishment. Look at it as an opportunity to us to reach out to those that we know are suffering. We know that there is a point, uh, that there is a 2% point prevalence. You have 100, say if you have 100,000 doctors in the state of California, and I don't know how many you do have, but 2% uh, of them are addicted to substances right now as you speak. Whether or not you want to admit it, that's the truth. I would say that we reach out to them because they are putting others in harm as a result of their addiction. There's anywhere between a 10 to 18% lifetime prevalence of addictive disease. I say we reach out to them and help them, try to get them healthy so that they can help others instead of put them in harm's way. And then the, other, the last reason that, that would be objected to this, uh, to Proposition 46, would be uh, time spent to check the monitoring database. Uh, but I, th I think it's a small amount of time. Uh, it is so easy to check. I think there's provisions that can be made to allow others to check the data bank for you uh, in your office like we have in Tennessee. And if you look at the results, there, there, there's really uh, no logical ar argument against not being able to query the database before writing a, a prescription for controlled substance. In the state of Tennessee, we've been able to decrease the number of doctor shoppers by 46%. Our number of prosecutions for doctor shoppers have gone up by over 120%. 
I had a question asked today, it says Proposition 46, saving lives. Where is the saving lives? If you look at uh, prescription drug overdose deaths, accidental overdose deaths, in my state, Tennessee, they outnumber the number of deaths as a result of uh, 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 automobile deaths. Uh, prescription drug overdoses, we have more of those than we do automobile deaths. Well, that is a, if we can cut down on the number of doctor shoppers, we can lower the number of overdose deaths from prescription narcotics. That's where the saving lives come from. The saving lives comes from uh, not having doctors that are impaired causing damages uh, to patients that, that would not be uh, damaged otherwise. So uh, the benefits gr greatly outweigh the risk, and I agree with Jamie and Carmen that, that the cost uh, will, will be very minimal, and I think it'll actually save money in the long run and I think they have the statistics to back it up and that's why I've flown across the country uh, to support Proposition 46. Do you want to talk at all about how it's worked in Tennessee uh, in terms of the, the mandatory check because Tennessee is one of two states and, and uh, a little bit about that? Or absolutely. Gonna, absolutely. Uh, the Prescription Safety Act of 2012 that was enacted uh, required the doctors in the state of Tennessee to uh, to query the prescription monitoring uh, data bank before writing a controlled substance for more than seven days and to query the data bank yearly for ongoing prescriptions. Uh, I can tell you that the results are uh, nearly instantaneous. Uh, we're allowed to have someone from our office query the data bank for us. Um, and the results to me have, have just been outstanding. Um, and there's usually no gray areas. Uh, you know, it's not like that somebody is just on the, on the borderline of doctor shopping. Usually it is a very clear cut. Uh, the patient will be seeing, you know, multiple uh, doctors going to multiple pharmacies. And the thing that I've noticed the most about it is that it doesn't match what my gut tells me. My gut tells me, oh, I need to watch out. This patient has a lot of red flags, and then I check the monitoring database, and it's, it's clean as a whistle. And then other patients I look at and go, oh, there's a lot of red flags here. I need to really be careful with this one. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I check the, I check the monitoring database again. N no issues whatsoever. Another patient I check, I'm not worried about at all, and then boom, 10 doctors, 12 pharmacies, three months. So what the uh, monitoring database gives us is something that is objective, okay? It's not, it's not shaded by anything else. It's not, uh, it, it is not colored by any of the preconceived notions that I have. It is the single best tool that I have on a daily basis to, uh, to combat the problem of prescription drug abuse. And it takes almost no time away from my, uh, from my face to face patient care. I'm sorry, one more question, I promise. Uh, but since you're so rare to have a doctor to discuss this, can you talk a little about um, uh, why your colleagues and maybe other colleagues might not, uh, if they know a, if they knew a doctor was abusing a substance, how would they respond and how did that, that work in your case with your colleagues and, and how, as someone who was, as you said, intervened on, which, which your dad's here, maybe you could talk a little about how he did that. Uh, how did it feel when that happened to you? When it, when it comes to intervening on a, on a doctor, it is, is really hard. We're one of the few professions that's in, that has been entrusted with monitoring ourselves, and, and we fail greatly in that responsibility. And, and, and the issue is, or the problem is, it is so hard to do. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to hurt someone's reputation. We don't want to be responsible for them getting in trouble with their state medical boards. We don't want to be responsible for uh, hurting their livelihood. Uh, the problem is, is that that we as physicians uh, impact a lot of other people. We impact families, we Im impact patients, and we have a great responsibility uh, for, uh, for patient care. So what my dad ran up against was, he ran up against uh, uh, basically the blue wall of physicians. Uh, he knew there was something wrong with his son. He could see a great change in me. He could see a great change in my physical appearance. Uh, basically, I wasn't the same son that he used to know. It was, it was the same thing that my colleagues saw. And why was it the same Steve that they used to know. I was rounding at odd hours. My behavior had changed. Uh, I wasn't up to date with my medical records, um, but nobody said anything. They didn't want to get involved. It weren't that they were bad people, just they had other things going on. And what if they said something to me and I reacted in a negative way? Or uh, what, if, what if I wasn't using? What if they had made a mistake? And so they uh, kept to themselves. And my dad had actually talked to several of them. He talked to my nursing staff. He talked to other staff around to try to get them to help me and, and basically uh, 
didn't get anywhere. So he confronted me on his own. And the day that he confronted me was, uh, you know, turned out to be the best day of my life. I thought it was the worst day of my life at the time, but it was the best day of my life. And uh, when he did confront me and, and I came clean with him, I felt like a, literally felt like a drowning man in the middle of the ocean and, and somebody come by and, and, and threw me a life ring. And I grabbed onto it and that's when my life began to change. And I would ask the medical profession here in the state of California to look at it that way. Uh, as I speak right now to you in, you know, in the middle of the afternoon on a, on, on a Monday, there are doctors across the state of California uh, that are in their hospitals that, that are abusing drugs right now that think their lives are over, that think that uh, they're just going to try to get through another day and that uh, they don't have any idea how this is going to end. And I'd like for them to know that there is a way out and that there is help and that their lives can only get better. But they can't get better as they are right now because they don't have anybody to tell and they can only uh, wind up hurting patients. Um, I can tell you that it's been 10 years. I still, uh, I signed a lifetime contract five years ago, so I called this morning to see if I needed to be randomly drug screened. And the day I came out to the Bay Area this past Thursday, uh, I found out that I got a promotion uh, to the chief of medicine position at the hospital that I work at. So my life hadn't done anything but go up. Not only that, I'm a good option for my patients. I'm not impaired. I'm not using 100 pills a day. And I'm out here supporting a cause that I believe greatly in. Thank you. Um, any questions we have for, for anyone, for Dr. Lloyd or, uh, or Bob? You bet. Uh, in, any questions, fair game. Uh, the person that first noticed was me. Uh, I remember the day that I went from taking one to two. Um, it got to the point that that day that, that I went from taking one Lortab per day to two. I looked myself dead in the mirror and knew I couldn't stop. And that was a horrible day. But the truth is that I knew at that point that uh, there wasn't any way out. And I just, uh, that was a day that I resigned myself that, uh, I would just keep going and see where I wound up. And it was a, a horrible day. Uh, I got started by taking a leftover medication from a dental procedure. And, and these are some of, the, some of the things that we don't talk about enough. We talk about pill mills. We talk about doctors who are, who are misprescribing in, in quantities. The truth of the matter is, is that 75% of all first-time users of opiate narcotics get them out of our medicine cabinets. Okay, the medicine cabinets that we all have in our homes and they're leftover medications from a procedure. And so that's where mine started from. I had leftover medication from a dental procedure that I'd had months before and it was at the end of a long day. So whereas you might come home from the end of a long day and maybe have a, uh, maybe have a beer or a glass of wine or a mixed drink, uh, I had a, a, some leftover Lortab. And I knew that my patients abused these drugs and I thought, well, I wonder what it uh, feels like to take one of these when you're not having any pain. So I snapped the Lord tab in half and, and took it, and within 30 minutes, I felt like that I'd found the alcohol that nobody could smell. I felt at ease. I felt like I had a nice energy level, and that's where it got started. And within three and a half years, I was using about 500 milligrams of opiate narcotics daily. Oh, a lot of them. Yes, sir. Uh, I have. You know, if you'd have told me that I was going to be doing what I'm doing right now when I was in medical school, I'd have thought you'd lost your mind. Uh, I've intervened on, uh, on a lot of doctors in the, in the previous 10 years. And um, it's interesting the reaction that I get. Um, sometimes it's what you might expect. I have things said to me that, that probably don't bear repeating in, 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 in this scenario or this situation. But most of the time, it's, it's, the, it's the reaction that I had uh, when my dad intervened on me. And it's a feeling of relief and tears. Um, I cried for, gosh, I cried for two weeks, I think, that somebody finally knew. And then when I figured out I could get better, uh, that was a, a huge relief. And I figured, I, I, I figured out or, or learned that, that I had a very treatable condition. Uh, it was an even bigger relief. And so as I intervene on doctors and they start to see the same things and they start to see that they don't have to live their life the way that they've been living it, uh, it's the most fun I've ever had in medicine. The thing that I love the most about where I am right now is not having to chase pills every day. 
You think about whenever you get up to 25, 30, 40 pills a day, and you have to have that many every day, and the grind it is to come across them. Think about what that takes every single day. Uh, it's, it's such a relief to not have to do that. And then I think about what good I can do with those experiences. And I get people ask me all the time, you know, are you ashamed of that? Are you, do you wish you could do it over and, and not had to go through those things? And my answer is always the same. No, I'm glad that I had to go through those things because that's what I use to connect with people now. It's the experiences I use to connect with folks. It's the experiences I use to be involved with people like Bob Pack now and people like Jamie Court. It's why I'm out here now. I want the doctors of the state of California to realize what I'm talking about. The things in Proposition 46 are, are not to punish anybody. They're to make uh, the patients uh, of the state of California safer. They are to impact the impaired physicians of the state of California in a positive way to keep them from harming patients uh, and to take them out of situations where they can cause patient harm and get them on a road uh, to recovery themselves. That's a nice fairy tale land they're living in. Uh, that's uh, simply not the case. There's a lot of things that have been created to prevent diversions, picks the systems, all kinds of accountability systems, and I can tell you uh, that there's a way around every single one of them, at least there has been in my experience. Uh, it, if that's the case, I mean, how do you divert thousands and thousands of pills? I mean, uh, I was able to divert a fair number of them myself, and uh, there's, there's just not a way to safely uh, account for all of them. Uh, there's, there's a hole in every waste system, I will guarantee you. Absolutely. Well, the, the one thing that I, I wish that I could take back uh, is that I used my friends. All of my friends are doctors, um, and that's just the nature of the beast. And I wish that I could take that part back it was because these were folks who thought they were helping me, and they were not improperly prescribing. They were good folks, and I took advantage of my friends, and I do wish that I could take that back. But that was the bulk of my source. Yeah, uh, if we can technologically do this, uh, I'm going to try to open the phone line and see if anyone has a question. Does anyone on the phone line want to ask a question? Hello? Okay, well.